here and then we may start. Okay. I'll just uh, check uh, who is already here. So Sarah is here. Hello. Uh, Julia is here. Hello. Uh, Marike is now also here. Hi there. Uh, Eleftherios is uh, the early bird here. So hello. <laughs> he was uh, earlier uh, than myself in the chat. Uh, Beatrice is not here yet. So let's wait for Beatrice then. Uh, Valentina is also missing up to now. And Alina Garrett and myself and are here. Okay, very nice. So to the uh, people who just entered the uh, chat now, I, I would do um, a 10 minutes introduction at the very beginning of the session, just explaining you the procedure. Uh, then you will have the uh, time and opportunity to ask me certain questions if there are any. And then we can start with the first three presenters. Can I ask you a question right now, if we have time? Uh, yes, sure. We have uh, two minutes until the start, so please go ahead. Just, just to be sure, so it's not that each presenter shares its own presentation, but it's just you sharing the slides, isn't it? Yes, exactly. I actually okay. wanted to uh, tell just this uh, in the introduction uh, round, but I can uh, do it also now. So uh, I will be the one that will uh, switch from one slide to the next. And um, yeah, the presenters, uh, they will uh, just present their slides. And if they want to switch to the next slide, they will just say uh, next and I will do the job. So we have uh, Galileo. Actually, um, you know that uh, maybe you don't want to do that, but you can also give someone temporarily uh, remote control, right? So they can switch their own slides or they can switch the next slide. You don't want to do that. Uh, okay, uh, I would suggest that uh, uh, I may uh, switch from one slide to another and if, uh, why, um, yeah, if there are any tech problems, then I can uh, try to give the authority to the presenters themselves <laughs> to switch the slides, if that is okay for you, of course. Yeah, so, sure, uh, my... it's a feature I recently discovered in Zoom and I think it's awesome. <laughs> yeah, so uh, Michael, I mean, uh, if I agree with what she just suggested, sometimes it's uh, better because, you know, when the presenter is presenting and having to be swapping in like in between every now and then say next, next slide, next slide. Yeah, and if you yeah. have to go back, say back, I know, or two slides back, you know, stuff like that, sometimes it may be, uh, it may affect the speaker. So I think it's, it, their suggestion is guess is best. It's just for the presenter to request for remote control and you give them the move. Okay, that by okay, okay, okay. I see. So we can do it uh, this way. Uh, I can uh, give the permission to the presenters themselves. Uh, yeah. Julius, I need please your help to uh, uh, yeah uh, to assist me with this. So how can I do that? For example, Sarah will be the first presenter, and I want to give her the authority to. Uh, I think we can already share our screen. Oh, ah, okay. okay. Are you able to share your screen? Hmm? No. Uh, uh, can you, are you able uh, to share your screen? Let one person try sharing their screen and see just before we start. Uh, okay, Julia, do you want to go ahead and try it now? Yeah. Yeah, Alessandra, please, because she will be the presenter. Yeah, I'm doing the thing. Alessandra, okay, please uh, try to do so. Yeah. Can you see? Oh, it? wonderful. I think it. Uh, it works. Yeah. Yes. So, yeah, so now we can beautiful. see. Uh, so I'm going to put it like this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we can Let's see now your cross justice. Uh, can you see it like the full screen or? 
Uh, yeah, now now. You, you, need, you need to click on yes now. Now, now yeah, perfect. exactly. Perfect. perfect. Okay, okay, awesomely. So if uh, this will be a small minor change to our session now, but I would then suggest that we proceed this way. So each, uh, uh, each and every one of you will present your slides by yourselves. Uh, just please feel free to share your screens and then uh, we can do it like this. Um, to the uh, people that just have entered the, um, the session, welcome. I see uh, Tin, Giuseppe, uh, and Galileo are also here. And Valentina Presuti is also here. Hello there. Very nice. Uh, so, okay, I would uh, then suggest that we start right now with the uh, introduction session. Uh, therefore, I will um, share my screen now. One sec. Okay, clock is here. And I would then share my screen. Please uh, tell me whether you can now see the uh, slides. Can you see this, the slides? Yes, yes. Yes, very nice. Okay, good. Then uh, that being said, let's start with our session. So uh, ladies and gentlemen, gentlemen, welcome to the ESWC EU Project Networking Session 2021. Uh, my name is Michael Fribus. I am from um, Hanover, which is in North Germany, and I am working at the Leibniz University Hanover and the TIP, which is the uh, research center that belongs uh, to the um, university. Um, uh, together with uh, Alina Brokop and Gerrit Rosam, which are also here on the call, I have organized this session and I will be your host for today. So uh, that being said, uh, let's continue with the introduction itself. So um, this is a short wrap up how, uh, the, um, how the session will look like. So each and every one of you will have 10 minutes for your project. Um, so uh, the presentation itself uh, should be seven minutes and then uh, we should have a three minutes Q&A session. Um, I would suggest that you please uh, send your questions to uh, to myself with the Zoom chat. So uh, we have a, uh, a chat function here. And uh, after your presentation, I may read out uh, the questions and then the presenter has the opportunity to answer uh, to uh, those questions. Uh, please stick to the time plan. So um, after approximately six minutes, I will uh, just uh, briefly tell you, you have one minute left and then uh, please try to uh, finish your presentation as soon as possible. Uh, after seven minutes, I will do a shortcut. If uh, you need a little bit longer uh, than that given time, and then uh, we will proceed with the Q&A uh, session. So uh, yes. Um, please note that uh, we will have two five minute breaks in between. I will uh, share the agenda in a, uh, uh, the next slide. And uh, also please note that since you gave me the consent, the session, this session will be recorded and you, uh, each and every one of you will receive the re video recording at the very end, um, uh, after the session I meant, sorry and the project presentations will be shared with you um, via email also after the session. Uh, in total, we have planned two hours for the networking session. So yeah, uh, this is how our agenda looks like. So we are uh, going to start with uh, Sarah and the Cleopatra project. Afterwards, we have Julia and the Cross Justice project. Uh, third one will be Marike and Odo Europa. Sorry if I mispronounced it. Uh, afterwards, we will have a, a five minutes short break. Uh, then we are going to continue with Eleftherios and the Music Code project. Then we have Beatrice and the 4CH project. Uh, on sixth will be Valentina and the Polyphonia project. Afterwards, we will have another uh, five minutes break. And the last three presenters will be Alina and Media Futures Project, Garrett and the Trusts Project, 
and uh, me, myself, and the Platoon project. And at the very end of the session, we will have uh, the opportunity to uh, yeah, have a short feedback round of approximately 10 minutes where you can share your ideas, feedback, uh, comments, wishes, anything what you like. So uh, that being said, uh, do you have any questions so far before we start? Um, yeah, so they need to raise their hand. If anybody wants to ask a question, they uh, need to raise their hand. Okay, no okay, yes, I'm, I'm, uh, okay, I'm trying to uh, look up the, uh, the chat function, whether we have the, something. Okay, I'm just checking, is there anybody raising uh, his or her hand uh, right now? Um, if there are any questions in between, uh, just please feel free to uh, ask me uh, directly and then uh, I can try to uh, answer them uh, as, as good as I can. So uh, if there are no questions so far, uh, may I suggest you that we all turn on our cameras so that I can uh, do a screenshot and uh, I can share it with you uh, after the session as well. And you may use it for, for example, social media or in general uh, for whatever you like. So, oh, very nice. Very nice people here. <laughs> very good. Uh, Mariana, Abrail, and Andri, maybe you can also turn on your camera if you if you can, if you like. Or maybe you are a bit too shy. <laughs> uh, and Elizabeth is also here. Uh, so please uh, turn on uh, your cameras uh, now, and I may do uh, the screenshot now. Okay. Elizabeth, thank you. Mariana, um, Abiral, if you also may uh, turn on your camera. If not, then uh, it's also okay. Then I will uh, just do a screenshot now. So uh, now please uh, look to the camera, uh, make nice uh, smiling faces and I will do the screenshot now. So, okay, let's see. Uh, I will count until three and uh, at three, I will do the screenshot. So one, two, three. Very nice, very nice. Okay, perfect, perfect. I did it, very nice. Then I will uh, save it just now. Very nice. If you if you want, we can do another one just as a backup, because it was so uh, so fun uh, just now. So uh, once again, another screenshot. Uh, in one, two. <laughs> Sorry, this was not planned. Sorry, okay, uh, once again, one, two, three. Very nice, thank you very much. I think that should be it. So I will also save it. And then we can punctually start with our first presentation. And here we have Sara. So uh, Sara, um, Welcome, first of all, and do you want to share your screen now? We, uh, maybe you can unmute yourself somehow. Yes, do you hear me? Yes, I, uh, we can hear you, yes. Okay. No. And we can see your slides, very nice. So okay. um, please start. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Sara. I'm a part of Cleopatra Project, and I'm going to introduce it uh, to you. Uh, let me start with some uh, general information and this project. Um, Cleopatra uh, is a 
discretionary EU funded project from uh, the European Union's Horizon 2020. 15 PhD students here uh, in this project working in different research institutions and in five countries. You can see um, the logos of these institutions uh, on the left and a nice picture of us on the right. Um, I should mention that uh, Cleopatra is connected to uh, different partner organizations and stakeholders, such as uh, libraries and uh, digital humanities uh, researchers. Now uh, let's move to the next point, which is uh, the motivation uh, behind Cleopatra. Uh, we all uh, probably know uh, recent events such as terrorist attacks, Brexit, and the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, which have extremely impacted uh, Europe and the world as a whole. These events uh, have resulted in a huge and growing amount of information, which are different in terms of um, the languages and the sources they are generated uh, in. But the important point here is that this information has the potential to reflect how differently people think of an event across different language communities and how differently the, uh, the events are represented to them uh, in the uh, news articles. And this is the exact idea behind uh, Cleopatra, analyzing these events uh, by taking into account uh, the mentioned differences. Uh, now, uh, I'd like to talk about the knowledge processing pipeline uh, in this project, uh, which shows how PhD students uh, contribute uh, to the project. We have four stages here, uh, starting from extraction and alignment. We try to get an overview uh, to the multilingual information. Next, we have validation and contextualization based on the extracted uh, results uh, from the previous stage. Then uh, in the third stage, we try to help with efficiently and effectively exploring and access to the multilingual information. And at the end, we have analytics. Some of my colleagues are working uh, in this stage on uh, very interesting topics such as uh, interesting topics such as politics, uh, sports, information, uh, propagation, and bias. Uh, now that uh, we have talked uh, about the motivation behind this uh, project and I've showed you the knowledge processing pipeline, uh, let's take a look at the accomplishments we've had uh, so far in Cleopatra. The image in this uh, slide represents uh, one of the major uh, contributions uh, in, in this project. We have worked on different sources and languages uh, and the results uh, that extracted data sets are successfully integrated into a knowledge graph, which is called OEKG. Uh, OEKG uh, is a larger scale uh, open event knowledge graph, which is publicly available to the users and uh, researchers. Uh, besides uh, OEKG, we have other uh, tools and demonstrators, which are uh, again, publicly available uh, in the Cleopatra repository. Uh, now, uh, let's talk about uh, OEKG in a bit more detail. Here in this table, we have uh, different data sets in OEKG, which are mostly uh, developed during this project. Uh, since we are pushed for time, I'm going to talk only about one of the data sets. Uh, even KG plus click, the second data set uh, is a, a multilingual uh, user interaction uh, data set, which could be used for recommendation. And now I'd like to draw your attention to the uh, domain uh, column of this table, which shows that OEKG supports different types of information, uh, such as images and text, as well as uh, various applications like question answering, recommendation, um, uh, and named entity recognition. Uh, I should mention that the core idea behind OEKG these different data sets, which enables it uh, to uh, get results to uh, complex queries. Um, I want to show how we could benefit from this uh, integration of data sets uh, by these two examples. Uh, here uh, on the left, we have the events related to the First World War and uh, of the locations of these events. And on the right, we have the headlines of news articles related to Brexit. Uh, with their sentiments. Uh, here we have only a few rows of this table, uh, but you could see 
that the sentiment of these news articles uh, are uh, changing uh, over time. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, these two uh, queries are done uh, by the integration of data sets in encourage you to take a look at it yourself and try uh, some uh, other interesting queries uh, to OEKG. And finally, uh, this is one of the demonstrators in, in Cultra, which is called uh, Geobind. Geobind is a geo-coordinate estimation tool in which by uploading an image or selectable images uh, in the uh, in the demonstrator, uh, you could get the predicted location of the image uh, on the map, as well as uh, some other useful uh, information, uh, such as uh, the Wikipedia label of the location or uh, related events. One minute to left, it. Sarah. Sorry, one minute left. Okay, uh, and uh, related events uh, to the location, to the location of the image, uh, which is done by connecting to OEKG or retrieving some uh, news articles related to it. Um, as you can see here uh, in this demonstrator, in this uh, example, uh, the input image uh, was uh, Notre Dame de uh, Paris and uh, the location and the label of it uh, are co correctly predicted by the uh, two. Uh, let me skip the details here and ask you to try the demonstrator, the tool yourself, and refer to its paper uh, to get some uh, other details. Uh, and at the end, we have useful links of the papers, repositories, and uh, tools uh, I mentioned during this presentation, and the contact information uh, here. Uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, I'd be glad to hear your comments and uh, answer your questions. Thank you very much, Sarah. Uh, perfectly seven minutes. This is very nice. So uh, do we have any uh, questions now? Uh, please feel free to send them to me in the chat. I can see one question now. Um, so Sarah, uh, how long is the project duration and what are the plans for sustainability after the project? Uh, the project started uh, in uh, 2019, uh, and uh, if I'm uh, correct, I think most of us started uh, from July 2019. Uh, and I think that uh, the idea behind the publicly available results of the data set is uh, the plan after uh, the project uh, is end ended. Uh, we have uh, the results of our projects, uh, the, the use cases uh, we, we have worked on, and it's uh, all available uh, in OEKG and uh, the GitHub repository. I have the uh, links here in the last slide. Mm -hmm. And I encourage, uh, encourage you to uh, check them. Yes, yes, certainly. Uh, we will share your presentation as well as all the other presentations after the uh, session. So, and yes, thank you very much for that. Good. Um, are there any other questions for Sarah? Please feel free to send me your questions via the chat function. So, Sarah, uh, can you maybe explain uh, which kind of uh, stakeholder groups your uh, project is addressing exactly? So, j just a couple of examples, if you okay. wish. Go back to the slide I had. Uh, so, we are uh, working with um, digital uh, libraries. We are working with British Library and uh, digital humanities institutions. And the the results as uh, the the multilingual analysis of different events uh, could be interesting for different stakeholders uh, and from the top of my head i can uh, mention uh, the digital humanity researchers and different libraries mm -hmm. Okay, very nice. Uh, I would uh, suggest that we uh, now go on with the uh, next presentation. So thank you very much, Sarah. And next we have, uh, oh, so sorry, I don't know why it is not working now. Uh, 
Um, excuse me. Uh, Maria. Hello, sir. I do want to stop sharing your screen. Yes, yes. Yes. Uh, just excuse me for one sec. Uh, uh, is it a start? Yes. Yes, okay. now. Okay. So we have next uh, Julia and the Cross Justice uh, Project. So, Julia, do you want to continue? Yes, and it will be Alessandra presenting. Ah, Alessandra, yes, very nice. Hello, Alessandra. So uh, if you wish, you can share your screen now and then you can start presenting your project. Wait, Alessandra. Uh, Alessandra seems not to be here somehow. No, I think. So No, he is. Unmute oh, yourself, please. I was looking for. Okay, uh, now, yeah, sorry. It was yes. like ah. the guest is preventing you from opening the Microsoft. So I was I looking for your name. Know. Sorry about that. <laughs> I couldn't talk. <laughs> sorry. Okay, so let's start. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm going to share the presentation, first of all. Mm -hmm. Okay. So. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Alessandra. I am a research fellow in criminal law um, at the University of Bologna, and I'm here to introduce you to Cross Justice. Um, the project counts seven international partners spread all across Europe, uh, including legal and the computer experts, both Hello, from university. Sorry? Share your screen, please. We can't see your slide up now. Yes, oh, Alessandra, sorry. please I'm feel free again. to share uh, your slides. If it's not possible, then I can do it. No, no, I can you. do it. Mm -hmm. I can do it. It was mm -hmm. just maybe, can you see it now? Coming up. Yes, we can see it now. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. Now you can see it, no? Go yes. on, we can see your slide now. Okay, perfect. Sorry. So I was saying that the project um, examines the procedural safeguards of the accused as recognized by the six EU procedural rights defensive, uh, both as such and in their implementation at the national level. So cross justice examines the shortcomings in the protection of defense rights, aiming to develop a comprehensive approach for the translation into a computable language of the EU procedural directives and implementing national legislation and case law. In fact, starting from the general background, the protection of fundamental rights for persons accused or suspected of a crime is one of the main aims of the EU policy in the area of justice. However, the effective protection of those rights has been heavily affected by highly varying legal frameworks, which characterize member states' regulations. Therefore, Cross Justice focuses on the six EU defense directives that the European Union has started uh, adopting in 2010 in order to harmonize and enhance judicial cooperation. In fact, in this peculiar field, legal actors often struggle um, to identify uh, and which legislation and therefore which procedural rights are applicable in a specific case. That happens for different reasons. I would say, first of all, the linguistic barriers and also the peculiarity, the particular aspects of the, le of, of the different legal uh, systems. For this reason, the project has examined 11 uh, legal order asking how the directives have been implemented, what impact they had on the domestic criminal proceedings, how and if those directives has affected the very notion of fundamental rights at the national level. So the main goal of the project, of course, is creating one online and free platform which could provide automatic assessments and outcomes available to all the users. The idea here is highlighting potentially uncovered deficit of the normative text and enhancing a comparative analysis 
to foster the knowledge of legal professionals, but also law researchers, NGOs, and all the EU citizens which might be interested. Cross Justice aims to reach a deep analysis of the procedural safeguards to identify the shortcomings and remedies adopted at the national level, and of course, to foster and increase judicial cooperation towards Europe. So at the current state, the platform is running and operative in its demo version. Um, it provides two different modules. The first of one, you can see it here, is the legal database module, which supports the user information on criminal procedures. Uh, it improves common knowledge on legislation and case law, thanks to all the information gathered and uploaded by the researchers partners. And in addition, it also helps amending the linguistic barrier as national legislation and the main aspects of national case law have been all translated in English. Then the platform also includes a second module, the advisory module, um, which allows users to get practical advice on how to solve a specific case. So the platform starts from very general questions and reach more and more detailed answers in order to identify the national legislation applicable to the case, the current case law, and also providing the user a critical comment on the quality and uh, the standards of implementation of the EU provisions. The second module also offers a mass testing, uh, which is a tool aiming to support policy makers in evaluating the level of harmonization towards a comparison between remedies and solutions adopted at the national level. Well, considering the outcomes that we expect from the, pro from the project, of course, is like increasing the practitioner's abilities on the issues related to the rights of persons suspected or accused of crime across Europe. Then we think that the platform could improve common knowledge on the legislation and the case law in judicial cooperation as for procedural rights are involved. Alessandra, one think, minute left. Yeah, oh, sorry. Yeah, I'll be fast. And also strengthen the cooperation in, in the exchange of information between judicial and law enforcement when criminal rights are involved. So the project um, has last, um, it was like a 24 months work and is going to end next February. So from now on, we are planning to disseminate the results of the research, of course, advertise our research, uh, but also continue challenging the platform. That's why um, the project's partners have arranged next uh, summer and autumn workshops to ask legal practitioners and legal experts to test the platform and provide new feedbacks in order to continue developing and improving our work. So thank you so much for your attention. I hope I was on time. And I'm here if you have any questions, comments on or critiques on the project. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Alessandra. Uh, very on time. So uh, do you have any questions, dear um, participants? Okay, we can. Uh, I can see here uh, some uh, questions. So, uh, Alessandra, uh, how and who can test the platform? Can you please elaborate more on that? Of course, you you can also try it. Uh, I guess that the, the slides would be shared with all the participants. So, if mm -hmm. you try the demo version of the platform, it's just uh, open to all the users to to go there and try to. To, to ask the platform how a, a, like a, a concrete case or a, like an Im imaginary case can be solved uh, depending on when the EU um, defense directives are involved. So every, everyone who uh, access the platform can, can try and discover how uh, a specific procedural guarantees 
has been implemented in one among the 11 countries that we examined. Mm -hmm. Okay, very interesting. So here we have another question, uh, Alessandra. Besides policymakers, who is your key target group besides uh, policymakers? Also civil citizens? Yeah, of course, like civil citizens, if they're interested in the legal uh, issues, but we are thinking more about legal professionals, I would say. So let's imagine a lawyer living in Italy and having a client who had a problem uh, in, uh, in the Netherlands and wants to understand how the procedural safeguards work on, in the Netherlands, he can ask um, Cross Justice uh, what's the national implementation of the safeguards uh, um, guarantees and how is the, ca the case law um, most um, has, how has dealt with the problem and if also there are some struggles um, considering the, the quality and the level of our national harmonization. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, here is another question. Do you also work together with the Easy Rights Project? I really don't know Easy Rights Project. Uh, here is a link shared uh, in, the, in the chat. So we, we could, <laughs> maybe in the future, I guess there would be like interconnection. Yeah, we, we would love to. Like mm -hmm. one of the goals would be also like trying to, to develop the project because we just considered 11 jurisdiction uh, could be an, a chance also to enlarge the, the research and to continue uploading and uh, uh, like uh, updating the platform. We would mm -hmm. love to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much, Alessandra. I would suggest that we uh, stop here and that we move on with our next presentation. And uh, uh, if you could please stop uh, sharing your screen. Hi, Michael. Thank you very much. Yes. Hi, Michael. Hello. Yeah, just to inform the authors that if they do, if they have access to Slack channel, they can share their slide there. I mean, for easy definition and follow up. Some other authors have already uploaded that. Uh, the slide there. So if you mm -hmm. haven't done so, you can also do it. The link is in the chat section. Here. In the chat. Thank yes. Thank you very much, uh, Julius. This is very helpful. Yes. Uh, also, for your information, dear participants, we have uh, a link there. So please check it out and there you can share your slides. That being said, let's continue with uh, Marike. And here we have uh, Odo Europa. Marike uh, cannot uh, talk. Um, Thank you. Yes. Now I can. Yes, can you yes hear we me? can hear you. Right. Hello. Hello. <laughs> so um, I'm here to uh, represent the Ojo Europa project. I'm, I'm not alone today. So here in this um, very same session, there's Rafael Troncy and Pasquale Lucena, one of my uh, two of my colleagues. Um, but we have many, many more colleagues. Um, mm -hmm. Actually, um, we have uh, seven partners in six countries. So uh, two partners in the UK. Um, I'm uh, one of the researchers at the Royal Netherlands Academy of Arts and Sciences Humanities Cluster based in Amsterdam. I'm the project manager. Um, we coordinate this. Uh, we have computer vision experts in Germany. Um, we have semantic web experts in Slovenia. We have text mining experts in Italy um, and text mining and semantic web experts in uh, France. And then we have museology and history experts in uh, the UK. Uh, we started in January. We're going to run for three years. So uh, pretty fresh, not as many results yet as some of the other projects here. Um, yeah, we've got a lot of ambitions and milestones, but you know, that's just stats for you. Um, well, really what we want to do is we want to semantically model smell and um, work with museums to reconstruct smells and bring those smells to their exhibitions and uh, Create resources for historians and others to uh, to recognize or to to investigate smells from all sorts of different angles um, by using, for example, uh, text mining to analyze huge, huge corpora um, and see if we can find references to smells and how people dealt with them and what people thought of them. Um, but also from huge uh, uh, data sets of images. Um, so uh, for that, we thought we need an olfactory knowledge graph. Um, and uh, because we think what we can do there is we can interlink data from the different domains. We can really make this data reusable. 
make the relationships explicit. And this is, of course, very, very difficult because we also want to be dealing with uh, data from 1600 to 1900. So we have to deal with concept drift. We have to deal with diachronic changes. Um, it needs to be super expressive and uh, what we call olfactory AI applications. So how do you compare a smell or two smells in, in a knowledge graph, right? What, what does that mean? Um, so, and, and it's kind of interesting because um, perfume makers and um, chemists, they have vocabularies to talk about smells and compare them, but it's not formalized um, and not digitized. So um, uh, we're very excited about this challenge. Um, so how do we go about this? Uh, we're really at the start of this. Um, so uh, we're designing an olfactory representation model. Actually, the first draft is, is there. Um, we're also collecting specialized vocabularies. So indeed, from chemists, from perfumers um, that have terms. We're also uh, cre uh, you know, gathering texts and images now that we can do this text mining and computer vision analysis on. Um, and then when we have the computer vision and text analysis up and running, hopefully in uh, uh, month 18 of the project. So, well, I mean, it should be running before then, but that's what we need to deliver the first version. We're gonna populate the knowledge graph um, and then also connect it to all the uh, data sets from the linked open data cloud that we all know and love. Um, <clears throat> so we've been thinking a lot and actually this has really, really been very interesting part of the, of the project. Um, and, and, and this is really also where I think semantic web research can make a real difference in, in how to think about these things. So it's been very, very instructive to talk to our art historians, our olfactory historians, our regular early modern historians um, about what does it mean to think about something as profoundly undigital as smell? Um, and what do you need to capture in a data model um, in order to yeah, do something useful with it? Um, so there are sources, what are things that smell? Um, practices, what are things that people do with smell? Um, what are people involved? What are artifacts? What are places that are important to smell? Um, so what we wanna do from that is, is in our analyses, um, you know, derive meanings and identities and storylines from that. So what does that look like? So we've got a smell, but you know, what is a smell? I mean, if you ask chemists, it's a bunch of molecules. If you ask a perfumer, it's, it's a combination of various compounds. Um, so we have, um, we define a generation event. So how did the smell get made? And an experience event, because um, uh, we talk about smells that we experience. We smell something and then we have an opinion on it. We mention it in a book or we paint about it. Um, so this doesn't look too complicated, but then when you start linking it to um, sources, um, it becomes a little bit more complicated. And there we do also, um, uh, you know, use uh, standard modeling from CDOC CRM, um, linked art. So we're not, uh, and provenance. Provenance is very, very important. So we're not just making it up ourselves as we go along. Um, and um, yeah, then in, in a you know, later step, we're gonna figure out how can we actually visualize this, make people deal with this. Um, so this is some, some, some just examples of olfactory vocabularies that have been there before. So scent wheels are very, very central to olfactory research. So we're also uh, looking at those and also ingesting those in our model and in our knowledge graph. Um, and they're often, you know, you, you, you can think of these, these um, wheels, um, hopefully if we convert those to a network, then, or to a graph, then they are up. One minute, awesome, I'm almost through my slides. Um, that gives a very, very interesting view. And that's also very interesting for the other partners in our, in our project, how, how to think about these things. Um, so yeah, it's very challenging, but, but heaps of fun. Uh, so, um, yeah, we're capturing non-digital concepts. We need to deal with change over time. Uh, we're also bringing a big, big network. So we have museum partners, cultural heritage partners in the, in the project. Um, but also a lot of people have um, uh, approached us. Um, and I think, you know, maybe, maybe we were wrong, but we did a lot of digging. And I think we're the first ones who are actually developing an olfactory semantic web data model. Um, 
So maybe for you, if you're interested in this, what we have to offer is uh, resources. So we're, we're currently annotating data sets, creating this knowledge graph, putting together vocabularies and ontologies. Um, and we really want to hear from you, um, you know, what are you doing in terms of multilingual uh, okay, concepts? Time is up, Marika. Yes, uh, but you're from almost, multiple uh, you're, you're actually no, already fine. done. Thank you very much. Sorry that I had to interrupt you, but we are already over seven huh? minutes. Fine. Yep. But thank you very much for your presentation, uh, dear Marike. I have to say it is a very unique and interesting project. Um, actually, first time that I um, yeah uh, hearing about this kind of idea. Uh, so um, I'm going to look in the chat. Uh, are there any questions for Marike? We have one question here. Uh, what considerations are made in regards to the multilinguality aspect of the project, especially as it concerns alignment of terms? As it concerns, what's the last thing? Um, as it concerns alignment of terms. Oh, alignment of terms, yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah, we're covering um, English, Italian, French, German, Dutch, Slovene, and Latin. Um, so that's a lot. Um, so most of the project partners uh, are covering one, uh, you know, the, basically their own language. Um, and uh, we are looking into, uh, you know, connecting uh, the, the terms we use to, to WordNet. Um, we have experience with doing this kind of multilingual semantic uh, mapping where we, uh, we take multilingual WordNets basically um, and try to connect those. But of course, a lot of the terms, especially older terms, and it seems to be that people used to talk about smells a lot and had a broader vocabulary about that are not in those word nets. Um, so um, yeah, that could be that we, we you know, try to create an extension of something like that. Um, I hope that answers your question. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Marike. It is indeed very, very interesting. Uh, it's a shame that we only have uh, 10 minutes for each project. I would really uh, like to have. Yeah, but I mean, talk to me on Slack and uh, you know where to find me. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there is another question. What was the inspiration idea behind the project? Are there any commercialization ideas for the future, dear Marike? Um, so, um... Well, one part of the project that I didn't talk about is that we um, uh, we're also going to be creating uh, policy and policy documents and uh, and also guidelines for museums to put smells into them into their uh, exhibitions. Um, a bunch of our uh, people uh, are already working as consultants for museums in how they can bring smell into into their museums, and of course, we hope to to create this big knowledge graph that is going to be freely available that um, uh, people could use. Um, and we have been approached by a few makers um, to maybe add some background knowledge to it. Um, we're not in it for the um, commercialization, um, but we might think about spin-offs. But since we're only half a year in, we thought let's do the work first and then think about those things. Okay, thank you very much, Marika. That being said, uh, I would suggest that we will uh, do our five minute breaks now. For that, I wanted to share uh, a screen with you uh, so that you all know. There it is. Uh, yes, I would suggest that we uh, make a, a five minutes break now. Um, and that we continue at 15.20. So now you can uh, yeah, drink water, uh, go to the toilet. Uh, and yes, we will continue then um, in five minutes. Thank you very much and see you very soon.
Welcome back, dear participants. So uh, let's wait for a couple of seconds and then we continue with Eleftherios and music code. Eleftherios is here, very nice, hello. Uh, Eleftherios is muted, so maybe we can uh, somehow unmute him. Okay. Now you can hear me, correct? Yes, Eleftherios, hello. All right. Very nice. So uh, if, you, uh, if you wish, we can uh, continue with your project. If, uh, yeah, if you want to start, then go ahead, please, and share your screen. All right, so you can see my screen. Present presentation mode. So, uh, hello everybody. My name is Lefteris Vlidorikis. I'm coming from the University of Ioannina in Greece. And it's my pleasure to present Music Code. It's a European project that just started five months ago. Uh, the title is an experimentally validated multi-scale materials process and device modeling and design platform, enabling non-expert access to open innovation in the organic and large area electronics industry. So with this, I'm switching gear to something really in engineering. Um, so why do we need a modeling platform? Um, we're targeting um, the electronics, uh, organic electronics industry, and in particular, uh, printing and gas transport uh, processes, either for printing organic uh, photovoltaics or uh, organic vapor deposition for OLEDs. Um, there's many things to gain from modeling. Uh, in terms of understanding, screening new materials, optimizing, improving, exploring, basically enabling virtual research and development. In order to do that, uh, we need uh, a modeling in multi-scale and multi-physics for materials, uh, physical interactions and device functionality. So what we envision in MusicCode is to create a, a unique open innovation environment. It's an open innovation platform for materials modeling. Um, it does have integrated data management, ontology-based semantic interoperability between models, scales, etc., and of course, a user-friendly workflow design tool. So we have four main objectives. One is to improve the modeling uh, competencies that we have, modeling from quantum to continuum, uh, improve and enhance uh, the computational infrastructure for workflow design, data management, uh, execution, etc. Cooperate and collaborate and uh, with others, uh, stakeholders, and exploit, of course, what we will create, and eventually use everything to demonstrate use cases uh, in OPVs, organic photovoltaics, and organic light emitting diodes um, with real uh, industry uh, industrial examples. So these are the four main objectives of the project. If I, if I may show the, the, the main concept, uh, the center thing here is a data management uh, system. Let's call it data layer with the links to outside the marketplaces, business decision support systems, open innovation environments, etc. cetera. Um, uh, Python tools uh, switch you to the user layer where you can design workflows, uh, template them, etc. This is for the expert user. Uh, once you have data and workflows, you can go to the uh, multi-physics uh, integration framework where different uh, models from quantum to continuum uh, can run and uh, MUPIF can actually facilitate their execution to different high performance computing centers across different countries and different places in Europe. And of course, having the data, having the results, you can go back to the user layer uh, where you can visualize, analyze the results, uh, optimize, make decisions, etc. So it's a complete innovation environment. And ontology basically is the key uh, for the different layers to communicate with each other. And of course, the different models to communicate with each other. So what type of data we need here? So we're, we're simulating all the way from electronic interactions between organic materials to the mesoscale with microstructure evolution, charge transport for the, the, the molecules, uh, fluid dynamics for the actual uh, fabrication processes, uh, and of course, uh, 
continuum uh, simulation of the devices and the modules that you want to um, uh, optimize, understand, and simulate. Uh, semantics are really important here. We aim for a semantic connection between uh, the, the data and the applications, uh, the code that we're using. So replace the traditional syntactic way. Um, we're starting now. We, we're gonna start from MMO and uh, then uh, derive our use cases, uh, our ontologies for the organic and large area electronics. Uh, it's critical to collaborate with similar projects. So we're really looking forward to collaboration with similar projects that are more experienced in semantics and ontologies. Uh, critical is to have a database that can support this. So the, the ontology we will develop, we will be mapped into the database with a data, uh, database schema. Uh, we're looking at ontologies for atoms, molecules, grains, layers, and devices going from the lowest scale all the way up to the highest, the device, and of course, ontology for workflow, uh, workflow templates, execution, et cetera. All of this together, we, we aim to provide a complete semantic-based data and service APIs and keep these ontology mappings, you know, represented with metadata along the whole simulation chain and optimization and visualization chain. Uh, so this is an example. This is uh, what we have now created, this work in progress, of course, as a molecule ontology, as it is uh, visualized in Protege, and through the database schema that we have created, this is how it will be represented in the database. So these are interchangeable. Um, also critical is to have a modeling workflow um, design tool where you can drag and place uh, model nodes and also data nodes one going minute. from one place to the other. And this, you know, will be working with semantics. So this is how we envision the user experience here. Uh, a user from industry comes in, he has certain questions, he designs a workflow, uh, the process goes into the database and into the uh, integration framework. All the different scales are run sequentially, uh, coming down to the final result that you want with the actual material properties, everything packed by multi-scale characterization. So everything is really uh, validated. Uh, and then you get the result of the device and then you end up with being able to design uh, and produce uh, improved uh, uh, devices. So we have our industrial users to validate uh, what we create, uh, the, the, the people, the companies that we create, the actual uh, user interface. Yeah, Eleftherios, please finish and, the slide and then we... Uh, and we, then these yeah. are, we, we are basically uh, 11 partners from different parts of Europe. We just started. Uh, and please find us um, in you know, email or websites. So, Social media accounts. Thank, please, you, very please, please, Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Eleftherios. Yes, very nice, very nice. Uh, maybe if you like, uh, you can show the uh, either this slide or the slide before uh, so that the people, uh, the attendees have the chance to have a look yep. at it. Good, okay, uh, question time. Uh, in terms of collaboration, what do you expect from potential partners, dear Eleftherios? So, really is what would be an appropriate way to use ontologies and semantics. Um, what is the best way to align with other projects so that what we create is compatible with, uh, with other ontologies being created. Uh, we do plan to have a complete business proposal at the end of the project uh, with this platform being uh, a commercial uh, proposition uh, being linked to marketplaces, et cetera, and the other marketplaces developed. So mostly we're looking for uh, proper ways to conduct and develop the ontologies that we're gonna be using and the tools, APIs to create, to connect to other uh, platforms. Mm -hmm. uh, another question, why a relational database? Do you plan to use ontology-based data access such as ONTOP? So we're not sure exactly how deep and how high level ontology we're going to be using. We definitely want to have a semantic relations between all the data and how we exchange the data, transfer data from one scale to the other, from one model to the other, 
uh, from database to the uh, execution layer. Um, how, uh, what type of ontologies eventually we will create, it is something that uh, we are looking uh, forward to discover. Uh, as I said, we just started five months ago, so we are now in the beginning of the project. Mm -hmm. So this is still open for us. Okay, and last question, maybe a bit uh, quicker because we uh, are already running out of time. The ontology you designed in Protege, has it been used anywhere? If yes, how did you do that? No, this is just uh, basically the last two weeks work where we defined the semantic description for a molecule and the atom. And uh, we uh, try to see how it looks in Protege and how it maps through a schema into the database. Um, so it's not shown or put anywhere else. Mm -hmm. It's just very recent that we're looking uh, you know, how it looks. Okay, thank you very much, Eleftherios. Also a very interesting project and presentation. Uh, so uh, well, if, if you, yes, thank you very much. Uh, next on our list is Beatrice uh, and the 4CH project. So Beatrice, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, Beatrice, Markov. Can you try on mute? Okay, yeah. Thank mm -hmm. you. I, I, I was not able to unmute. Um, so now I share my screen. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Is it okay? Uh, yes, if you can make it bigger, it's uh, also nice. Um, yeah, but yeah, very good. Okay, so uh, hello. Yes. 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 So just for you continue, I think you are using a, a system with two desktops, so you are sharing the wrong one. I guess you want to share the different one, the other one. Yeah. Okay. Because it is sharing us with the uh, speakers note as well. You just want to share the screen that yeah. has the main slide. Okay, but I don't see now. No more. To Just see. click on uh, view, Beatrice, view in the top bar. Zoom. Uh, okay, okay. Yes, or uh, Beatrice, if you like, I can also share the screens, uh, the, the slides for you if you, if you wish. Okay, I prefer. Okay, so this is the 4CH project. I will open it. I hope that these are the correct slides. You're not sharing your screen, uh, Michael. Okay, yes, uh, one sec, please. Okay. Wait a sec. Okay, there you go. Uh, so there it is. Uh, you can see the slides now, right? Thank uh, you. Hello. Yep, yes. Beatrice. Mm -hmm. yes, is yes. it okay? Is it, it's okay, yes. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, I'm presenting the 4CH project, which is just starting for three years and aims to build a competence center for the conservation of cultural heritage. And um, what motivated this project, second slide, is first that cultural heritage is one important piece of what we can share with, other, with each other. And it may be exposed to various dangers as listed here, in particular due to climate changes and digital technologies can be used to mitigate the risks and remediate their effects but there is a need to centralize the good practices and tools for sharing them disseminate them and make them actually usable and reusable by others um, the objectives so, are to provide a framework able to foster collaboration between institutions and to facilitate a full use of data collected for the pres preservation of monuments and sites. 
19 partners are involved. The project grew out of the results of another project called Inception. It is led by the INFM Cultural Heritage Network together with the PIN at Prato. Several enterprises and scholar institutions participate from 13 countries. Uh, it's an interdisciplinary collaboration ranging from physicians to archaeologists. Uh, next slide, I'm on the, sorry. <laughs> next, okay. Again, next, please. I'm slide on... four, right? Yes, uh, I've already talked about this slide, so I'm on the five, fifth slide. Okay, Please tell you. me next if I should uh, switch the slides. Yeah, Thank sure, you. Sure, sure, sorry. Uh, what particularly concerns the semantic web community in this project is uh, this focus on the notion of digital twins. A digital twin is a virtual replica of an actual entity which can be queried by softwares without the need of accessing to the actual entity. So that's the uh, definition. And uh, we can see that it requires to have not only a representation of the entity itself, let's say, for instance, here, a church, but also its surrounding, its content, the current one and the past ones, uh, its history, etc. And when we get all these various models and data, we also need to represent their relationships. So digital twins must rely on a robust and rich semantic description. Next, please. And more generally, the project will build on the inception methodology for 3D modeling and also on several solutions for managing results of analysis, models, reports, documentations, and for exploiting these data. There are also standards, ontologies, and vocabularies that will be reused and extended for creating a core knowledge base, because this knowledge base will provide the context for linking the digital twins with their environment and also uh, to each other. Next, please. So uh, this is a big picture of what is intended to be in the 4CH knowledge base, both for human and machine consumptions. Uh, each of these different kinds of information and points of views about monuments and sites will be conceptually represented with ontologies and vocabularies based on the semantic web principle that led to the linked open data cloud um, with one more very important objective, which is usable, uh, the linked, let's say, the linked open and usable web of data. So next, this is the reason why I thought it was important to present 4CH to the ESWC community. We aim to collaborate with other projects to the creation of your European Cultural Heritage Common data space really usable by all. And we, of course, I've already learned many things in this conference. Uh, it was a pleasure for me to listen to Jacob Bitt's talk at SEDIT workshop last Sunday. I also enjoyed very much the problem to solve before you die session yesterday about the multiple voices to be kept about an heritage artifact. So, uh, uh, of the, all these things are very interesting. Next, please. So the choice in 4CH is to organize the ontology around a core uh, CRM 4CH on a CDOC CRM basis, because the partners well know the CDOC. They already use it for what it is, a high level framework for data integration. There already exist many extensions of the CDEP that will be reused and new ones will be devised or incorporated for instance. Yes, you have one more minute, sorry. Thanks. 
Uh, for instance, with my colleagues, we are currently working with architects with a French national project on designing an heritage arch architecture ontology with its commented vocabulary, mainly taken from the French book, Le Vocabulaire de l'Architecture de Pérouse de Montclos. And it could be reused uh, and completed later on for 4CH. So in this slide, it's important also to notice that the knowledge pairs uh, will be used as an aggregator. We don't want to centralize in, in everything. And uh, most of the data will be at the data owner's side and the processing at the edges of the cloud. So next slide, please. It's the last one. Okay, Beatrice, I would suggest that we wrap up now. Um, I will show the last slide and then uh, we uh, will give the others the opportunity to ask questions. Yes, uh, um, it's okay. Yeah, it's It was just a little bit more precise about the ontology, but it's okay. Yes, yes. Thank you very Thank much. You. Yeah, um, but uh, yeah, we in seven minutes are uh, over now, unfortunately. Uh, but uh, yeah, uh, we can show the slide and the participants may ask their questions now. So um, I will try to uh, chat. Okay, uh, so here we have the uh, questions for the um, um, what are the stakeholder groups that contribute to the project? Uh, well, I, as I said quickly uh, on slide four, uh, there are um, archaeologists, uh, the PIN Prato, the, it's a team of archaeologists. Uh, coming from the IAM Plus project, uh, also a European project, and the people from the Inception project, and um, for the oh, oh, for presenting all the teams, I I cannot because it's a project that begins and I don't really know all the partners. I'm sorry. I'm not the leader of the project. So. Okay. Yeah, I understand. I understand. Yeah. Okay. There are physicists uh, in Portugal, physicians, sorry, in Portugal. And uh, I thought of, of them uh, when I saw the, the previous presentation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you, Beatrice. Are there um, uh, more uh, questions to Beatrice? The yeah, participants. Okay. Um, good. If there are no, I forgot uh, to to put my camera. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. No worries. It's okay. Okay. Good. Uh, Beatrice, thank you very much uh, for your presentation. Uh, I will. Thank you. Uh, um, ah, good. Okay. Yes. Maybe uh, this slide here as well. So here. Uh, uh, I assume uh, are the, uh, the website and uh, your email address uh, for the um, for all our participants for your information. So thank you very much, Beatrice. Uh, since there are no uh, more questions for you, we can uh, continue with the next presentation. Uh, and this is Valentina Presuti. I will stop sharing my. Uh, Green. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. Now, good. Uh, okay. Good, Valentina. The floor is yours. Hello. Okay. Thanks. Let me share my screen first. Uh, not this one. Okay. So, can you see my screen? Is it the right one? Yes. 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 We can see it. Um, are you seeing the the presenter uh, or the the right? Uh... Yeah, it's the auto screen, so you need to uh, swap your screen, maybe. Better. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Okay. So, uh, so I'm talking. I, I will talk to you about Polyphonia, uh, which is a project that started in January. So it's uh, pretty young. Uh, we don't have. Uh, much results yet. Uh, so I'm 
telling you more about our uh, goals uh, and plans, although there is already some resources that you can, uh, uh, you can uh, see, share, we are already sharing. Um, in these slides, you can uh, hopefully collect uh, all the links that you need for uh, starting following us, joining us, and uh, there is the GitHub repository. And of course, I would uh, uh, like to invite you to follow us on Twitter um, and look at our website where we uh, also uh, share information and advances. Um, the project is planned to last 40 months. We have 10 partners. Uh, there are cultural institutions, uh, computer scientists from academia, as well as the musicologists and historian of music uh, from academia as well. Um, and uh, uh, it's a very interdisciplinary consortium. Uh, and what, so we have, uh, we, it's a very ambitious project. What we want to do, uh, I, I'll, I'll uh, explain our objectives uh, through a few examples. We want to support institutions, digital uh, uh, cultural heritage and memory institutions, as well as music providers uh, to um, um, uh, exploit uh, at best the value that they have hidden in their content, in their digital content. Um, so we want them to be able to um, uh, make better business with it or better enhancing the, the, the value uh, and the content of uh, the, the cultural heritage that they own and manage, uh, musical heritage. Um, and we want to enable as well uh, data-driven policies for digital, uh, for uh, cultural heritage institutions. At the same time, we want to impact on the citizens as well uh, by providing the novel ways of uh, um, uh, um, disseminating cultural heritage so that they can become more aware of, uh, uh, of the complexity and variety of uh, musical heritage. And we want to support um, researchers. We want to create resources and applications for them because we want to support their research methods and actually push their research methodologies towards a more scientific data-driven um, uh, approach. Um, uh, what I mean is that we want to enable for them uh, to use large-scale analysis of data because now they mainly do manual inspection of specific catalogs and data set. In short, we want to impact on and support studying, managing, interacting with and preserving musical heritage uh, knowledge. And how do we do that? We do this by, so we will, uh, our research will be driven by 10 pilots, uh, which are, um, uh, which address uh, all these four dimensions differently. Of course, I don't have the time to go into details, but on the website, you can find additional uh, information on them. And of course, you can also contact me. Um, and. Uh, how do we do this? Well, we have, uh, we, we want to build a knowledge graph. Actually, we want to build many knowledge graphs that would be interconnected. And we want to do this by looking, by starting from uh, heterogeneous sources. So we, our musical heritage is encoded uh, in uh, many different types of, uh, uh, of uh, sources, such as text. And uh, this text can be from, of many styles. So we can have uh, the perspective of politicians, artists, intellectuals, critics, and general, generic peoples in different texts, spanning and covering different places and times. So meaning multilingual and diachronic um, uh, perspective uh, dimensions. We have also, um, uh, of course, sounds, audio uh, uh, contents, and we have symbolic notations for music. So we will basically, so what, what Polyphonia is working on is to develop novel knowledge extraction uh, methods, leveraging, of course, also on existing ones, to extract from these different sources to discover hidden patterns that may reveal uh, unexpected links between 
uh, um, between music uh, uh, related content uh, and this means relating uh, different music traditions between them in terms of for example uh, potential influences that have been um, uh, there for uh, for different uh, in different uh, different times and different places and different music traditions but also to the social and historic context through um, stories and, uh, uh, and other uh, things that can be extracted from text. Um, of course, we want to impact beyond our consortium and this is what we are doing is that, that we have already uh, started building our uh, uh, stakeholders network. There is Albert Meronio who is here actually in, in, uh, in the audience with me, who is one of the uh, members of the Polyphonia team who is leading this task. So he's the right person to contact if you think you have a use case or any, uh, or if you just want to be uh, updated and be part of the, our stakeholders network. So if you have use cases, you want to be an early adopter, One minute you want left. to bring uh, I know, thanks. Um, uh, you want to bring uh, new resources and pot potential links. Um, there are many activities that we plan that can be of interest for possible networking from training for, uh, uh, for uh, um, uh, young teenagers, for example, to artistic installation and the novel ways of building open artistic installations. Um, to conclude, uh, I just renew the, inv the invitation to join us. Uh, uh, there are all these uh, references or to visit our GitHub. Uh, one thing we have already achieved in terms of networking is that the Audio Europa and Polyphonia have teamed up and there will be a first workshop of multisensory data and knowledge at LDK in early September. So maybe some of you may be interested in uh, attending it. Thank you. Thank you very much, punctually, very punctually, very well done, uh, Valentina. Good, okay, uh, that being said, are there any questions from your side? So uh, what do you expect from potential stakeholders? Uh, any requirements they should fulfill or how could they benefit from the project? You are muted. Valentina, you are muted. Yeah, uh, yeah I, I couldn't know. unmute. So. Uh, okay. Can you repeat, please? What do you expect from potential stakeholders? Any requirements they should fulfill or how could they benefit uh, from the project? Well, Albert may intervene if he thinks uh, he has anything to add. Well, we don't have requirements. Uh, uh, what we look for is mainly, uh, you know, organizations, uh, researchers, anybody, in any agent, let's say, that uh, think, uh, uh, thinks that they can have either a use case, so helping us in extending our understanding of the requirements that we may address with our data and applications that we develop, um, uh, also in terms of interaction, for example, which is one of the key parts uh, uh, of our developments as well. Uh, I mentioned, of course, the knowledge graph and the AI tools, uh, I forgot to, to emphasize that we work a lot on, on interaction uh, as well. Uh, and on the other end, uh, early adopters as well. So like if you, uh, for example, in my opinion, the Cleopatra uh, and the 4CH projects that I heard today, uh, I think there we may have some link. Uh, so, so certainly I think we should try and uh, know what happens in, uh, in each other project. Uh, but also individual organizations, uh, the, again, there's not a requirement, but the interest in either adopting our technologies, testing it, that would be very, very welcome, or giving, uh, helping us in uh, extending our understanding of the requirements. I don't know, Albert, if you want to add anything. Uh, is, um, if you can unmute him, uh, that would be great. Who should be unmuted? Albert Meronio. Albert Meronio. Thank okay, you. Sir. Maybe, maybe, maybe saying it's okay. Yeah, now <laughs> it works. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, no, I just, I just wanted to, to emphasize what Valentina just said. So the, the, um, what we're looking for in, for in stakeholders is either the fact that you 
are the collection holders or either you know textual collections or musical score collections that have an intrinsic need for in, for integration using knowledge graphs and in and, and semantic technologies um or whether you have unsolved uh, competency questions um or you're interested in being uh, early adopters of the of the technology that that Valentin explained Mm -hmm. Very nice. We have 30 seconds left, so maybe uh, very briefly. Uh, are there any plans in terms of exploitation and sustainability for the project in future? Um, well, it's a bit early, but of course we, we are uh, working at our plan for, uh, for sustainability and exploitation. Now we are mainly focusing on dissemination and communication, but I'm already mm -hmm. working with the <coughs> some local, you know, some institutions to make sure that our data are hosted um, in, um, um, in an infrastructure that can survive uh, beyond the project. And there is an interest, what I can say is that uh, there is at least uh, in Bologna and the region of Emilia Romagna, uh, there is interest in, uh, so they are planning to support this type of projects, especially in music related projects. So we have already some uh, good, uh, uh, good options okay very nice thank you very much i would suggest that we will do our next short break now uh and that we continue at punctually 16 uh cst so uh, uh will... can i ask one thing uh Fribus? uh is there uh, do you plan to share with uh, with uh, the participants like a list of contacts so maybe, yes, yes, you know, yes, yes. We, we because there's not to, to, a lot of time to discuss and uh, interact, and uh, as this is meant to be a networking, uh, yeah, <laughs> so it yeah. would be good if we can uh, catch up later. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We, we plan to share all the presentations after the session, and uh, yeah, Julio uh, has kindly uh, um, shared the link in the, uh, in the chat, which we can uh, use. Uh, to upload our slides, but I will also share them via email. And uh, yes, and um, we will also share the recorded uh, video with uh, all of you uh, after the session. Yeah, just to add to that, Michael, um, yeah, the conversation is actually going on on the Slack channel. So even the questions that are not asked here, you can actually ask there and the speakers are responding to it. So yeah, okay. everybody you can say. Okay, mm -hmm. okay, good. Then let's do our break now and we continue at uh, 16. Then uh, thank you very much and see you later. Yeah.
Okay, very nice. So, Alina, do you want to continue with your presentation now? You can maybe unmute Alina. Uh, is Alina now unmuted? Um, I don't know why you can't hear me. Hello? Ah, yes. There you go. Um, so, uh, can we maybe unmute uh, Alina? Uh, we cannot uh, hear Alina. I don't know why. Um, one sec. One sec, please, Alina. Uh, oh, yeah, I think now it there works. There you go. Right? Okay, very okay. nice. Okay. Can you uh, just confirm that you can see my screen? Does it work? Yes, Alina, it works. Okay. Thank you. Perfect. So, hi, everybody. I'm very happy to be part of this very nice uh, session today and getting to know you and all your projects. I'm Alina working at Leibniz University Hanover as project manager and business developer for EU H2020 projects such as Media Futures. And first of all, um, Media Futures is part of the STARTS ecosystem and STARTS is an initiative of the European Commission um, to foster alliances uh, between or um, alliances of science, technology and the arts, which means starts, um, to implement a European approach to technological innovation, which are based on uh, human needs and human values. Um, what is Media Futures and what is the background of our project? So for several years, we are facing challenges like um, filter bubbles, misinformation, disinformation, hate speech, and many, many more, which take place online. Um, so the role of media is, is changing and also extremely um, discussed as um, our public opinion is increasingly formed online, where um, the content is often optimized for clicks rather than it is balanced for, for information um, exchange, which, which is based on facts. And the project Media Futures is funded by the European Commission under Horizon 2020. And it started last year in September 2020. And Media Futures is a transnational European data innovation hub, which brings together startups, SMEs and artists from the media value chain. And we are aiming to create or support products and um, services or digital artworks that uh, will reshape or redefine the media value chain through the innovative use of, of data and um, to support user generated content. Um, here you see our project partners and within our project we are bringing together 10 partners from six European countries namely Belgium, France, Germany, Italy, Spain, and the UK. And uh, based on our background, we have a multidisciplinary um, expertise and complementary expertise in running data entrepreneurship and also media initiatives. And we are, of course, um, respecting the legal requirements and, and principles which are set by the EU, um, ensuring transparency and inclusivity. Um, as I said before, our project um, is looking for artists and startups to redefine the media value chain. 
And during the project, we um, or the project runs for for three years um, until August 2023. And um, until this time, we are supporting uh, in total 51 startups and 43 artists um, in a total of three open calls. So these are our, um, let's say, application rounds or application phase. And um, in total, we are distributing um, an amount of 2.5 million euro. And uh, we are supporting these selected applicants uh, within a six month acceleration program. So we have this acceleration program for startups and SMEs and a residency program for artists. And uh, both programs, so the acceleration and the residency is including funding, mentoring, training um, and networking, of course. Um, yeah, we are funding or are looking forward um, to have um, many products, services and artworks transforming um, the way people are consuming news and um, people are engaging with facts or also fakes. So as we have um, oftentimes now online and in our social media channels, uh, which come, comes along our way. And um, we want to support experts who are making decisions and, and contribute to society. And um, such products and services, so um, the startups and artists um, can be considered as, as pilots um, with their ideas and they should use data and AI, um, so artificial intelligence to support, for example, high quality journalism, science education and also digital citizenship. Um, besides funding, we are mainly offering um, technical and legal support, data resources, so the basis for um, their projects, um, mentorship, we have um, dedicated mentors and advisors in our project, um, training sessions, peer learning methods, um, networking, and of course, marketing promotion and um, the dissemination of the project, so of the startups and artists and their ideas um, through um, events and communities like, for example, today. And in total, we have um, three tracks to apply for. Um, first of all, this is the Startups for Citizens track called SFC, which is an accelerator program for media startups and SMEs. We have Artists for Media, our AFM track, um, which is an artist residency program. And we have the um, mixed track, so to say, the Startup Meets Artist track, um, where we are supporting uh, joint projects and collaborations between startups, SMEs, and uh, artists on the other hand. So we are bringing them together. Um, here you see an overview of our tracks and uh, phases and the respective funding. So we have three phases in total um, during the acceleration and residency program, which are the start, build, and exhibit phase. And, one one um, minute, Alina. Yeah, thank you. And they um, they sum up to six months in total. Um, and the overall funding sum, which I mentioned before, is uh, yeah, let's say split uh, through these phases, and the payments are linked to the project success and um, to regular progress meetings uh, with our mentors and advisors. Um, just to have a look at our first open call, we identified four challenges for the first open call. Um, viral complexity, building bridges, the new mediators, and an open challenge. And while the first three challenges um, are linked to the specific topic around COVID and um, coronavirus and misinformation around um, COVID, the open challenge was not tied to COVID and uh, we ensured therefore more flexibility and creativity um, to come up with uh, other innovative ideas. Um, a quick overview about our first open call. So the call in numbers, let's say, um, we received 133 applications from uh, more than 30 countries. And um, yeah, it was a very successful open call. And um, the second open call will be launched in autumn this year. So stay tuned and um, yeah, many thanks for your attention. And if you are interested in, in more info or in networking or any project collaboration, um, please make sure to follow us on LinkedIn, Twitter. Um, we have a very nice website to visit or um, you can also contact me directly. Um, yeah, so okay. feel free Thank to you. reach out and well, many um, thanks. Thank you, Alina. Thank you, on time, very nice. <laughs>
Good. Uh, then let's start with the questions. So first question I that I can see here is, what is the difference between misinformation and disinformation, Dia Alina? Yeah, um, well, good question. So they are often um, used as synonyms or, um, yeah, which is misleading in, in some cases, let's say. Um, basically, um, misinformation is um, yeah, false or, or, or misleading content, which is shared um, online, for example, but without the harmful intent. So um, this is when people share false information with friends and family, but in good faith, let's say. So um, this is simply, um, yeah, misleading content, but without um, the intent to share it. While disinformation is um, false or misleading content, which is spread with the real intention to deceive or to to secure economic or political gain, for example, and uh, which is often um, linked to public harm or which raises public harm. And um, we have a lot of examples for this. And um, yeah, this is basically um, the main difference. So the intention to share or to not um, share um, false or misleading information. Mm -hmm. And the second question that I can see here is, what is special about the mixed track SMA? SMA, right. So this is the um, Startup Meets Artist track, um, where we are basically supporting teams. Um, so teams consisting of, um, the one hand, a startup, and on the other hand, um, an artist or an artistic company. And they are um, together developing new concepts of um, of data technology um, and arts. So a new form of, of collaboration, which is uh, very new in this industry. And um, yeah, these uh, projects are um, developed by the startup and um, the selected artists and startups will go to, um, to the start phase and um, yeah, entering uh, then the build phase, um, hopefully. And uh, this is all followed by, by dedicated pitch sessions where they can present their ideas and um, um, yeah, get um, throughout the whole uh, training session, they get um, mentors, um, advice and um, yeah, support in, in all of their uh, questions. And um, this is mainly the, um, the idea behind our mixed track. So to have this new form of, of collaboration. Okay, good. Thank you very much, Alina, for your very interesting presentation. Then I would suggest that we move on with our next candidate. And this is Garrett and the Trusts Project. So Alina, could you please stop sharing your screen? Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, so uh, Garrett kindly has requested me to share his slides, which I will, of course, uh, do. Uh, so, um, Garrett, uh, are you here? Are yes, you can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Perfect. Right. Okay, good. Uh, I will then uh, share the slides. Uh, share, so now we can see your presentation. And if you are ready, then please start now. Yes, thank you very much, Michael. I would like to thank you uh, and the ESWC for providing the opportunity um, to present trust within this format. Um, yes, so the next slide, please. All right, let's jump right into it. Um, trust stands for Trusted Secure Data Sharing Space and is an innovation action by the European Commission to address the needs of data sharing spaces, the data markets and the data economy. Um, the project started in January 2020 and has a duration of three years and is coordinated by the Leibniz University Hanover with its L3S Research Center. We have a multidisciplinary consortium with partners from Germany, Austria, the Netherlands, Belgium, Israel, Greece, Cyprus, Spain and Romania. Next, please. The trust partners identified these three high-level challenges that impede the growth of the data market economy. Um, the first one being that there is a lack of trusted and secure platforms and privacy aware analytic methods for secure sharing of personal data. Second, um, the proprietary and commercial industrial data hampers the creation of data market and data economy by limiting data sharing mostly to open data. 
Um, the third challenge uh, would be that there is an overwhelming amount of diverging technical standards, quality levels and legal aspects. So if data markets are limited to mostly open data, the business impact is not going to be very high. There's a real need for trusted and secure platforms that enable sharing of personal data as well as proprietary, commercial and industrial data in a secure way and in a way that complies with relevant laws and regulations. And uh, well, due to the abundance of laws and regulations, the different technical standards and uh, quality levels within the EU um, uh, impact uh, the interoperability of data markets and uh, it is rather limited due to that. Within Trust, we therefore aim to address these key challenges. Next, please. As the name suggests, we would like to reinstate trust in the data economy. We want to achieve this by developing our platform, building on the experience of two large national projects, namely the Data Market Austria and IDSA. The final goal we want to achieve is to establish a fully operational GDPR compliant European data marketplace for personal and industrial use. And it is envisioned that the platform works by itself as a platform, but also as a platform federator um, in order to allow integration of other platforms as well. Beyond this, it is quite important to build a legal and ethical framework to address all legal and ethical issues along the data value chain in order to cover all transactions from data owners, consumers, etc., from start until end. Next one, please. So the Data Market Austria is a lighthouse project which has invested quite a lot of effort to establish a data services ecosystem in Austria by, first of all, advancing technology foundations for secure data markets and cloud interoperability. And uh, second, uh, also creating an environment that encourages data-centered innovation uh, with the involvement of many SMEs, companies, and other innovation stakeholders at Austrian level. We do have three partners that are involved in this project, and that includes uh, Research Studio Austria, who coordinated the project, No Center, and the Semantic Web Company. Next one, please. On the other hand, we have IDSA in our consortium. The um, International Data Spaces is an initiative aimed at creating a secure cross-domain data space that enables companies across industries uh, and of all sizes to sovereignly manage the data assets. It establishes and enables P2P global um, dynamic data and business transactions between participants all across domains, sectors and industries, which is based in European values. Next one, please. So, based on these two data, data markets, we work towards uh, two key innovations, aside from the trusts platform itself, that is. And uh, on the one hand, we work out a solid legal and ethical framework for the trusts platform to ensure sustainability and compliance with all relevant uh, regulations and ethic principles. At the same time, uh, ensuring business impact is also very important as well. So, um, which is why we focus a lot of our resources on establishing a sustainable business model and a business plan, which includes products and service portfolio, clear pricing, billing, and, uh, and so on for the trust platform supported by a wide reaching uh, data innovation environment. So we really want to enable flourishing, um, the flourishing of the data economy in Europe here. Next one. So the nature of the project is uh, very practical. And by the end of the project, we want to have a up and running platform, which is fully operational. Therefore, we developed the platform based around practical business oriented uh, use cases. The first one focuses on anti-money laundering compliance. The second one is about agile marketing through data correlation. And the third one is all about data acquisition to improve customer support services. One so the there. Yes, thank you. The use cases uh, focus on the banking, telecommunication and ICT sectors, and we do have strong partners supporting us in each of the use cases. 
In all of these use cases, we work with mixed data, meaning we work with personal data and industrial non-personal data. And uh, in that regard, we need to achieve a balance between many frameworks, standards and requirements between stakeholders who each have their own privacy rights, business model, and therefore also their own interest. Uh, and achieving this balance is a major challenge of the use cases. Next one, please, last slide. Um, so I would like to thank all of you for your time and attention and would like to end this presentation by inviting all of you to connect with me. If you would like to find out more about trusts or if you have any other collaboration opportunities in mind, uh, make sure to get in touch with me via LinkedIn or email. Also make sure to follow us on Twitter or LinkedIn to find out more about trusts. And now I'm happy to answer some of your questions. Thank you very much, Garrett. On time, punctually. Very nice. Very well done. <laughs> Good. OK, uh, then uh, question time. Uh, so uh, first question we have here. Could you share more about what you are practically doing in the use cases? Um, sure. Can you go uh, back one slide um, to the use cases, please? Uh, yeah, one, one Last sec. Slide. Uh, yeah. One, one sec. Uh, this one. Exactly, yeah. Um, so sure, yeah, um, the use cases are meant to really test the technology to the market. Our first use case focuses on the detection of financial crime and more specifically anti-money laundering. And here we look uh, and uh, work on the design and development of adaptive analytics algorithms directed towards real-time transaction-based uh, anomaly detection. Uh, we furthermore work on advanced self-learning analytics models based on risk scores focused on anti-money laundering and continuous monitoring of uh, anomalous behavior and suspicious activity detection. And the second use case focuses more on marketing activities at a local level. Um, we work with big data analytics and see how they can be integrated in the platform and how they can provide timely and meaningful insights uh, targeting customers. And here we work with GDPR, anonymized CRM data, and the services offered by the trust platform are uh, anonymization protection from de-anonymization attacks, uh, data uh, valuation and correlation, and analytics for marketing. And in our third use case, we use uh, big financial data, but here we have more the element of um, human computer interaction and more specifically on robot advisors and chatbots that serve as automated assistants to help customers manage their debt, for example. So the business impact in this case, um, well, it focuses more on scalable wealth management services aside from the usual anonymization and data market, uh, uh, data protection services within this domain. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, 40 seconds left, uh, maybe uh, very uh, yeah, quickly if it's possible. Can you give more insights on the business impacts of the platform? Sure, I make it quick. I think some of them have been mentioned in the use cases, um, but one of the main business impacts that the platform brings is fairness and transparency. And in this regard, we work towards realistic business models that are customizable and safe, sustainable. Uh, that encourage participation among a wide and diverse spectrum of stakeholders in the data market. Uh, in our cases, we are trying to show that uh, via our use cases and our platform. Okay, very nice. Thank you very much, Gerrit, for your presentation. I will uh, then uh, continue with the very last presentation, and this is going to be the Platoon project. So um, I will uh, share my slides very soon. One sec, please. Is it the same author? Yes, 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 exactly. exactly. Oh. One sec, please. That is fine. But uh, uh, presenters, please don't forget to upload your slide on the Slack channel. If you are having issue accessing it, you can message me. We we'll have that sort uh, sorted out for you, so that you are able to upload it. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, okay, good. Then I will uh, share 
my screen. I hope you can see it now. Okay, very nice. So uh, then we're going to start with the last project. And uh, it is uh, the Platoon project, uh, which is uh, which um, yeah, is called Digital Platform and Analytic Tools for Energy. And without further ado, uh, we will start with the first slide. So uh, as I already uh, told you, uh, this is the name uh, of the project and uh, the acronym. Uh, it is an EU-funded H2020 project that has started last year in January 2020 and will end in uh, next December 2022, so uh, next year's uh, three years project. Uh, and the project itself uh, has its focus on the digitalization of the renewable energy sector. Uh, the main aim of the uh, project is to digitalize the European energy sector via uh, digital platform and analytics tools, as, as the name says it. Uh, so that means that we are aiming to develop an energy specific cosmic compliant reference architecture specifically for uh, energy related big data. Uh, that means, for example, that uh, we uh, are developing IDS connectors, enabling multi-party data exchange. Uh, thus, we ensure, uh, for example, data governance and data sovereignty, meaning that um, in the end, we want to increase the renewable energy share um, of the total energy consumption of um, the European countries. We want to improve the smart grids management and we also want to increase the energy efficiency of, for example, power plants of uh, those same smart grids, etc. And also we want to optimize the energy asset management. Our consortium consists of 20 different partners from nine different countries. The, these uh, you can all see on the uh, map here. So our countries where Platoon is represented is Spain, France, Belgium, Germany, Poland, Switzerland, Italy, Slovenia, and Serbia. Uh, and here on the same map, you can see uh, our uh, on the one hand, our pilot projects, which I will explain more in detail later. Uh, and on the other hand, uh, we have here the different partners that are participating in Platoon. Uh, and our consortium consists of uh, energy utilities, service companies, universities, research centers, uh, one accelerator and more. So we uh, can provide a broad uh, expertise here. Now about the pilots. Uh, so pl the project will be validated in seven pilots in five different countries that provide real energy big data cases. So for example, in ben Belgium, we uh, have the predictive maintenance of wind farms. Uh, in Serbia, uh, we cover the electricity balance and predictive maintenance of grids. Uh, in uh, Spain, we uh, are, uh, we have a pilot on energy grid stability, connectivity, and life extension. Then we have more pilots in, uh, for example, Italy, where we have the advanced energy management system and spatial multi-scale predictive models in the smart city. Uh, we have the energy management of microgrids, also an Italian uh, pilot. Then we have an uh, office building pilot in France uh, and we have uh, an energy efficiency pilot and predictive maintenance and where we uh, also uh, cover the predictive maintenance in the smart tertiary building upgrade, which is also in Spain. Uh, in the platoon project, we also have the uh, so-called open calls. So uh, these, uh, so platoon will facilitate the technology transfer into the market by uh, well-established tendering processes called uh, open calls. So the first one took place during this year. It was uh, from January to March this year. Uh, we had back then 96 successful applications and six winners in total. And the second open call will take place uh, in autumn this year and more info on that will uh, follow very soon. 
Uh, Platoon collaborates with Bridge and BDBA. So thanks to uh, Alexander Garazzogiani, with which, which, who is the uh, communication and dissemination uh, lead. Uh, thanks to her, Platoon is collaborating with Big Data Value Association, BDBA, and Bridge Horizon 2020. Then uh, I wanted to encourage you to please uh, visit our website as well as our social media accounts. So maybe a few uh, words on what me, myself and Alexandra, my manager are doing. We are leading the communication and dissemination work package in Platoon, meaning that we take care of that same website, of the social media accounts, uh, we are launching many different kinds of marketing activities, uh, and uh, that is our expertise. This is what we offer. That being said, uh, this uh, is our contact site. So uh, this is Alexander Garazzogiani, uh, which is uh, the communication dissemination lead. Uh, this is, um, um, yeah, me, myself, I'm the deputy. Uh, and uh, please feel free to connect with us. Please feel free to uh, follow, uh, follow Platoon on Twitter, on LinkedIn. Uh, there are a lot of interesting things going on. Um, and also please feel free to, uh, yeah, to contact us via email as well. That being said, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much uh, for uh, yeah, being very, patiently uh, and now we have actually uh, we actually reached the end so if you have any questions to me please feel free to ask good okay the first question is which stakeholder groups can profit from the digital platform and, and analytic tools uh, developed and tested in platoon uh, yeah, very interesting question. Uh, I can tell you that uh, there are two perspectives on this. So uh, as you all know, now a platoon is about the digitalization of the energy sector and the energy sector itself is uh, interlinked with, I would say, uh, almost, uh, if not all uh, industries that came to your mind. So that means without energy, uh, um, um, the uh, transport sector cannot function, the IT sector cannot function without energy, uh, and uh, also the, uh, yeah, the prominent uh, automobile industry in Germany could also not function without energy. Therefore, uh, in, in the broader sense, uh, every uh, yeah, um, industry could uh, profit from, uh, from the findings in Platoon. But in the narrower sense, uh, there are specific companies that can uh, profit directly and uh, in a much more extent uh, from the findings in the Platoon project that are, for example, the uh, constructors of uh, wind farms, uh, solar power uh, developers, uh, but also IT companies that uh, have something to do with the uh, uh, tools and the data platform that we are uh, providing. And yes, I hope that uh, could uh, answer your question to an extent. And the, uh, the next question is, what are the requirements for the second platoon open call that the applicants need to consider? Uh, so as I told you, the second platoon open call will, maybe I can go one slide back if that's possible. Uh, so uh, the second platoon open call will take place in this open and uh, the exact requirements are going to be shared soon. Um, but I can tell you that, for example, in the first open call, uh, we had uh, a total budget of 2 million euros. So that was the, I would say, pot of money. And uh, the winners of the open calls, uh, which were, uh, so we had six winners, they could uh, receive up to 150,000 euros. Uh, per project maximum, if I'm not mistaken. So I would suggest you to please uh, watch our social media channels, please stay tuned. And there you will receive all the information that you need. 
that being said, uh, we, uh, yeah, we have finished all presentations. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you very much for listening to uh, Platoon. And now uh, we are a little bit uh, over, yeah, uh, yeah, over the schedule time, but uh, if you wish, we can maybe have a, a short feedback discussion and you can share your thoughts and questions and uh, ideas uh, directly. Uh, maybe I would suggest that we can unmute uh, all now, if that's possible. Yeah, so now the, the setting has changed, so anybody I want to talk can unmute themselves. Ah, okay, request. good. Yeah, yeah. so uh, yeah, uh, please feel free to contribute. Uh, floor is yours. I uh, just one uh, general note. I just wrote it in the chat. Um, uh, I, I saw that some people had problems uh, sharing their slide via Slack. So maybe um, if you can just uh, maybe share the slides with Michael directly. I also had some problem uh, entering Slack. Maybe Michael, I can just uh, again send you the slides and you can share them with Julius. Uh, yes, sure. I actually have all the presentations here, but uh, yes, I think yeah. this idea is good. Please feel free to uh, contact me directly. Uh, I will post my uh, email directly into the chat and will share it with uh, all of you. Perfect. Okay, so please feel free to send the slides to me directly and I will uh, yeah, send it. Okay, uh, are there any, uh, any uh, yeah, anybody who wants to provide his or her feedback to us? Feedback, ideas, wishes, concerns? Well, maybe for, um, I, I think, I mean, it was super interesting to hear all the presentations, but there wasn't really much time to interact. And, you know, maybe that's also the Zoom format. And if we go back to, face-to-face -face conferences this will be different but uh yeah i mean i i think i think that would have been nice as well but mm -hmm. you know there's only so much you can do in in this time span so i also appreciate that but maybe there's shorter presentations or, or something to think of there for future events yes uh, marika you are actually absolutely right on that uh, i also as i told uh, you earlier i have wished that we would have more time but uh, we uh, yeah we received the 2 hour slot from uh, from the hosts and therefore we did the best what we could do and try to uh, present every uh, project that uh, were uh, willing to present themselves but in general this is a good idea maybe we can think about integrating this for the next time good any other uh, ideas I agree oh. with uh, Marike, but nevertheless, in the chat, um, there were some some requests already for from one project to another. So um, there seem to be some potentials for for collaboration, and um, yeah, hope that uh, we can reach out um, bilaterally or multilaterally if there are some some collaboration potentials. But um, yeah, I think it it worked very well um, also with the chat, and um, yeah, I'm sure we. We'll reach out to, so we received uh, a few questions and um, of course we will reach out to all of you and yeah, try to, to get the most out of the session today. Thank you very much, Alina. Are there any other uh, questions that you have? Uh, I will maybe use the time and uh, post the uh, Platoon website as well as our social media channels. So, uh, yeah, please feel free to uh, connect uh, not only with uh, Platoon, for example, but with uh, other uh, channel uh, uh, projects, uh, a lot of interesting things going on. Uh, and yeah, uh, 
just feel free to follow uh, all the projects on uh, on LinkedIn, on Twitter, on any other social media channels. So, uh, are there any other uh, questions? Okay, I will uh, share the social media channels. Cartoon. So if there are no uh, other questions, I would uh, suggest that we uh, stop here and that, uh, yeah, uh, I wanted to thank you all for uh, very much for participating for your very interesting projects. Uh, it was a, uh, it was a pleasure to, uh, uh, to hear you all, uh, to uh, see all your projects. I really wish that we would have more uh, time for uh, all projects, but uh, I think that we uh, used the limited time that we had to the maximum. Uh, that being said, uh, thank you so much again for your participation. Uh, we will